All right. So Amy, first of all, guys, if you're not watching me and Amy on YouTube, you should, because Amy is in a sailboat right now, which is super <laughs> rad, <laughs> which is like lifestyle goals. But I want to back up a little bit and we'll find out more about what has led you to live the life that you're living right now. Could you share just starting with your background in psychotherapy and how that like transformed into coaching and books and speaking and what you've learned on, along the path with therapy? Sure. Thank you for having me, by the way. Yeah. Uh, as a therapist, I thought, oh, you know, my, my message is going to get out into the world in terms of people that come into my therapy office, and it'll be based on what I learned in college. And I was sort of always interested in mental strength and what makes people tick. Mm -hmm. But it really became a personal journey when my mom passed away suddenly. About a year into my work as a therapist, I lost my mom. And then I just really wanted to know, okay, now I, it's not just about teaching people, but it's also about how do I apply these skills to my life? How do you go through painful experiences and learn from them? Because I would see people that would come into my therapy office and some of them went through tough times and they stayed stuck. They felt like they just were never able to get through them and be happy again. They had no joy, no hope, no desire to really make a better life for themselves. Instead, they often became bitter and angry. Mm -hmm. And, but then I saw other people who went through incredible hardship and they were still hopeful and happy people and they were optimistic and they look forward to the future. And so I thought, I want to know what makes these people tick. What's the difference? And I started studying them uh, partly for myself, but I wanted to know how then, how do I teach other people these strategies? And one of the things I learned really early on was it wasn't about what people did. Sometimes what made the biggest difference was what they didn't do. People who didn't have certain bad habits tended to do much better in life when they would go through hard times and they seemed to be happier, healthier, had better relationships. And so I started paying attention to that. And I'm glad that I did because on the three-year anniversary, it was three years to the day that my mom died, my 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. And I found myself a 26-year-old widow. I didn't have my mom and I'm supposed to be a therapist who helps people. Wow. I thought, how, now what do I do? And fortunately, by then I had learned a lot about habits and just how these little small habits make a huge difference in your life. And by not doing them, I could somehow heal from all the pain that I went through. And I mean, it took years, even knowing what I knew and having the experiences I had. It took a long time to figure out how do you heal your broken heart when it's not just like kind of broken, it's like smashed into a million pieces. And you have to, you know, our tendency is to always go around pain. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to feel that stuff, but you have to experience it. You have to go through it, but you then have to know how do you cope with it in a healthy way. And I'm so lucky that I was a therapist and I had learned a lot of things, learned so much from the people in my office. And, but, um, you know, by no means was I perfect. I still struggled with things, but I was in a place where a few years later I found love again. I got remarried, got a different job, got a new house. And I thought, Ooh, it's chapter two, finally this fresh start. And my father-in-law got diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I just thought this isn't fair. I shouldn't have to go through this. I grieved for so long. I can't grieve for another minute of my life and sort of dug in my heels as if that would make a difference. Obviously it didn't. And so I sat down and I wrote a list of all the things mentally strong people don't do. And it was a letter to myself that just said, if you don't do these things, you'll be okay. You'll make it through this. But no matter what you do tomorrow, you don't have to do 101 things. Mm -hmm. Just don't do these certain things. Mm -hmm. And that felt doable to me. Mm -hmm. When I was done, I had a list of 13 things. And I would read over that list and it helped me during the darkest and toughest moments. And so I thought, well, if it helps me, maybe it will help someone else. So I published it online and stepped away from my computer, hoping a few people would read it. But that list was read by 50 million people. Oh and before I knew it, a literary agent called and said, you should write a book. Yeah. But nobody knew the backstory. It was basically just a list. So people, I was wow. getting calls from national media that said, this is amazing. You're a therapist and you mastered all these things. And I was on, I was interviewed on a national media show just four days after my father-in-law passed away. And I didn't tell the story. I didn't say, actually, no, I struggle with these things as well. Uh, I just sort of went with it. And, uh, but when my book came out the following year, I told the rest of the story that yes, I struggled with these things and here's why. And that was back in 2013 that I wrote the article. My book came out in 2014 and it changed the course of my life. Ever since then, I have been yeah. writing and speaking and traveling and talking about mental strength and the things that mentally strong people don't do. 
Wow. And it was, it's so cool because you didn't even tell the story. You didn't even tell the, like the pain that this was bred from, but people felt that they felt the truth of it (laughs) because it came from a place, a deep place, not some like, Oh, I got to write an article today. Like here's some cool tips. It came from a deep place of connection and people felt that when they read it thing I had written for a long time, but most of my articles other than that one, were fairly sterile. It was research-based about mental health, depression, those sorts of things. This is really the only one that I ever wrote that was purely heartfelt. And I didn't Mm. cite any research studies. I didn't get into the background. It was just one that I wrote and it didn't take a long time to write. I wrote it off the cuff. I didn't really sit around and edit it because it wasn't meant for to become a book. I never imagined that this would happen. But yeah, it was definitely a raw and emotional article. And clearly people felt that when they read it. Yeah, absolutely. And I know your TED Talk is like very, it has, I think, what, 13 million views on it, the TED Talk where you talk about this. And I love, I was looking through your website and I love something that you said about coaching too. You said um, coaching is different than therapy in the fact that we're not revisiting the past and diagnosing mental illness and going through trauma. We're moving forward. We're moving forward. So can you speak on that, on how these habits, maybe if we can get into some of the habits of the things that people don't do, like how they help you move forward? Because I think this is a thing I love that. I love what you're talking about with being stuck, right? Oh man, how many, I mean, we can all relate to that in different areas of our lives. So could you speak on some of these habits and how they help us move forward? Absolutely. So as a therapist, uh, you know, I still have worked as a therapist, but there's certain restrictions. And so for a long time, I sort of resisted the idea of doing coaching, but from a practical standpoint, it made sense. I'm a licensed therapist in the state of Florida. Even if somebody wants internet therapy and they are in California, or if they want to talk to me on the phone, Mm -hmm. I can't do that. There's Mm -hmm. rules, regulations, HIPAA laws. I can't email people. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of coaching started by thinking, well, then I won't have these certain limitations, but I also love the idea of then I don't have to diagnose you with a mental illness. When you go to (laughs) therapy, if you want your insurance to pay for it, you have to Mm -hmm. be ill. Mm. And our mental health system is broken for that reason. Mm. If we only ever went to the doctor when we were severely ill, it, the doctor is going to struggle a lot more to help you feel better. If you had gone for a preventative test, you can prevent a lot of illnesses from happening. Or when you catch something early on mm-hmm. before you get really sick, you can do a lot. And so I feel like coaching is able to fill that gap. It's a way to say, okay, How can we take you from good to great? How do we make your life even better than it already is? How do we dig you out of this hole when you're only in it a little bit before you dig yourself so deep that you get stuck? Right. And, you know, it's often not about rehashing your childhood. And while I think there's definitely value in figuring out how do you develop these beliefs about yourself? Where does this label come from that you call yourself a certain thing or you uh, have this self-limiting belief that you aren't smart enough or you aren't good enough? And there's definitely value in figuring out where that belief comes from, but it's not just about rehashing and think your old wounds and thinking how horrible they are and ruminating on the past. Instead, it's about saying, how do you, how do you identify this emotional wound and how do you heal it moving forward? And sometimes we do have to go back to childhood, but it's not always about saying, you know, let's talk about that horrible thing that happened last week. One of the things I found in therapy is sometimes people just wanted to come in and tell me all the bad things that happened to them in the past seven days. And there's value in processing your emotions, but a lot of people would just kind of stay stuck there. We'd have to say, okay, that happened to you. You had a rough week. What are you going to do to make this week a little bit better? And while you certainly can't control all the things that happen to you, you have some control over how you respond to them. So let's talk about practical skills that you can use moving forward. And that's one of the things that I love about coaching is the freedom and the flexibility to be able to say, if you need to call me in two days, you can do that. In the therapy office, there's restrictions and my schedule was yeah. jam-packed and you couldn't do that sort of a thing. But in coaching, I have more flexibility, more ability to say, let's do something that maybe is a little different. Or if you just want to call me for 15 minutes, we can do that as opposed to you have to come in for one hour appointment or those sorts of things. So I feel like coaching gives me that flexibility. And it was really about saying, how do you, how do you move forward? Um, and part of that often is let's give up a couple of bad habits yeah. I find so many people are so busy. They have so much on their on their plates already. And then they're trying to figure out, how do I add this one more thing to my life? How do I add these 42 more goals to my schedule? Right. And they feel bad about themselves because they think they're not doing enough. <laughs> right. Whereas my argument is it just takes one bad habit to counteract all of those things. So if you just focus on your worst habit and say, how do I get rid of that thing? 
all of your good habits become much more effective. And I'm a fan of saying, let's work smarter and not just harder. Yeah. I love this so much just because, you know, in coaching health and fitness, I found, you know, it's much, people think I have to do this more. I have to do more, do more, do more, do more. I got to go right. to the gym more. I got to like <laughs> add all these things in. And I'm like, actually, if we can just work on you not overeating at night, that's going to have astronomical difference. But it's so yes. hard for people to not do. I That's what I learned for me too. It was harder to not do something anymore than it was to add things in. And I'm curious, like in your, in, I mean, cause you've worked with so many high performers and you've been speaking all over and it's just doing this over the years. Like what are those bad habits that you find to be the most common ones that really keep people stuck? So, you know, out of the 13 things, the one that people talk to me, no matter what kind of group I talk to, whether I'm talking to like some sort of government presidential appointees group, or I'm talking to a a fitness group, people always want to talk about number two, which is that mentally strong people don't give away their power. Yeah. And that one is really about saying, I'm in control of how I think, feel, and behave. But so often we blame other people like, oh, my boss ruined my day. My mother-in-law drives me nuts. My sister makes me so mad. And we literally give them the power over our lives. And empowering yourself is just about recognizing, nope, it's up to me to decide what kind of day I'm going to have. Nobody else Mm -hmm. has the power to ruin my day. If somebody else is in a bad mood, I don't have to take that on. I can still choose to make it the best day I can. Or if somebody does something and I'm upset by it, it's up to me to respond. I don't have to get all riled up and ruminate on it all day and let it ruin my day. And even right down to the language that we use. So often we say things like, oh, I have to go to the grocery store. I have to go to work tomorrow. Just recognizing, nope, actually you don't. There's consequences. If you don't go to work, you probably will get fired. Or if you don't go to the grocery store, you're not going to have food in the house. But just telling yourself it's a choice and I'm choosing to do it makes a huge difference in your mental strength. And for all of us to just recognize if I'm not happy with my life, that's on me. I have the power to figure out what do I want to do differently? How do I want to spend my time? What do I want my priorities to be? And who do I want to spend it with? So many people I talk to will say, oh, I'm surrounded by all these negative people. Well, guess what? You have the power to change that. If you want to surround yourself with a different social circle, by all means, go out there and do it. I love this talk so much. I Sometimes I can be a little brutal on social media. And I say, I'm like, if you're overwhelmed, that's a victim mindset. Overwhelmed right. as a victim. I have to do this and this and this and this. No, you don't. No, no. <laughs> you could just sit in your backyard all day. So you don't have to technically. You're choosing all those things. And I love this kind of talk because when I heard you say that in your TED talk about um, <laughs> my mother-in-law drives me crazy giving your power away. I was like, Oh, that's so beautiful. Cause we don't think about that. Right. We don't, we right. don't always take ownership in these little nuances of our emotional reactions to things. But if you think about the people that you admire most in your life and the high achievers, you know, they don't buy into that, that they, they know you can see that exemplified in their behavior and their reactions to things. Like they will literally just be like, they'll just divert and just move on to the next person. Like they don't even entertain that for a second, but I see, you know, and cause I'm a coach too. Like I see in the, in the mentalities of people that I'm working with, it's kind of like, well, this I'm a victim because of this person and this person, and this person. So I love that one. I love that one so much. Cause I think we all can find the truth and how we get into these little bit of victim mindsets of like, well, that guy cut me off. Like what, is, right. what an a-hole like, it, you know, but it's our choice on how we react. And That's the awesome. biggest one I hear is when people say, I don't have time. I don't have time to do that. Yeah. You know, you had 24 hours in your day and you choose yeah. how you spend your time. And if something's not a priority, just say it's not a priority. Not, I don't have time to do it. It's that I don't want to make time to, I don't want to move that up on my priority list right now. And that's okay. But just recognizing nobody's stealing your time. It's up to you how you spend it. Totally. I love this so much. And then like, even just you, I don't know the story of you're living on a sailboat, but like, that's amazing. Like, and that's another example. Like you chose that, right? Like, you were like, yes, I am doing that. <laughs> can you tell, can right. you tell me about that for you? Yeah, sure. So when I wrote the article and when I wrote my first book, I lived in Maine and had a traditional day job as a therapist and it was cold. It was dark. And my husband's dream since he was four was to live on a sailboat. It was never my dream. I didn't even okay. know people lived on <laughs> sailboats, but we said we would do it someday. And, you know, if there was anything in my life that I learned, it's that someday isn't guaranteed. If I wanted to live on a sailboat and I wanted to make my husband's dream come true and I was going to go along and try it as well, then I needed to just make it happen. And so it was cold. It was dark. We 
said, let's do it. So we bought a boat, moved to Florida sort of pretty quickly and made it happen. That was four years ago. And so we did it as a trial. He said, I don't know if you're going to like the sailboat stuff, but we'll do it as long as you still like it. But it's been four years and I love it. So, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, so I feel like I got to create a, a life that is really cool and fun and it works for me. I know not everybody's dream is to live on a sailboat, but uh, you know, to figure out what is my dream and then how do you make it happen? And if you want to make it happen, you can, you can find a way to do it. Yeah. I love what you said about someday. I got like ripped a new one by a mindset coach once that invited me to a mastermind really last minute. Right. I, I, I actually just had other plans. I couldn't go. And he said, I was like, but I'd love to come to another one someday. And he just tore into me. <laughs> like, he's like, Someday, that means you will never come. You will never be here because you use the word someday. And that's holding you back in so many places in your life. And I was like, gosh, dude, like, holy crap. Like, <laughs> it was a little intense, but I actually loved it because later on, it really helped me. It's like, if, if you say, I'm going to live on a sailboat someday. I mean, the, the weakness of that word is very different right. than you actually making the plan to do it. So. Exactly really cool. By the way, guys, if you're not watching the video version, <laughs> Amy's like jacked. <laughs> You've got like, like bicep veins and <laughs> look like you're a personal trainer over there. So well, that was a challenge last summer as an experiment. I had heard that, uh, of this guy that got six pack abs in 28 days. So I said, can a woman do it in 28 days? So nice. I called this, I called this trainer and said, let's try this. And, um, figured out that women can get six pack abs, but also the the side effect was it is I got biceps too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause you leaned out building that right muscle, out. That's amazing. Right. Okay. Well, how about another one? What's another thing that you really see hold people back and keep them stuck? Uh, the first one, which is that mentally strong people don't feel sorry for themselves. Uh, and that one, it gets yeah. confused a lot. People will say, well, no, I have to feel sorry for myself. That's part of the process. So I explained to them that that's not part of the process, that sadness and self-pity are two really different things, and but people get them confused often. And sadness is healing. When we are sad, it helps us honor something that we lost. It helps us go through some emotional pain. It helps you really appreciate being happy. Yeah. But for a lot of people... Uh, they get stuck in a place of self-pity when they start to think, oh, my life is worse than everybody else's. Nobody understands my problems. This is horrible and awful. I can't do anything about it. And it's when we get hopeless and helpless, and that's what keeps us stuck. Wow. And I see a lot of people, then they don't even try to solve their problems. Instead, they just think, well, there's nothing I can do about this, and they just let them pile up. And obviously that keeps you stuck in a really dark place for a really long time. And so it's important to recognize, am I feeling sad in a healthy way or am I starting to feel sorry for myself? Am I exaggerating how bad it is? Am I underestimating how capable I am to deal with this problem? Because there's always something that you can do to make your life or somebody else's life at least a little bit better. I don't care how bad your life is. There's always something you can do. And if you can just take those little steps and to recognize, okay, is this helping or hurting right now, this emotion that I'm having? You can do this with any emotion, but especially with sadness. And to know, oh, it's okay to be sad. When you go through a breakup, when you're going through tough times, you just lost a loved one or you miss your old job, being sad helps you honor that loss. And that's okay. You can feel sad. I think sometimes we're so intolerant of uncomfortable emotions that we try to constantly cheer ourselves up or we run around doing all of these things to, to mask it, to numb ourselves out. And it just makes it worse. Those emotions are still there. You just have to learn how do you cope with them in a healthy way. Wow. Yeah. What do you, what, for somebody who can relate to that and they're like, okay, yeah, I'm sad, but they're like, okay, maybe I am getting into pity. Like, how do you suggest that they transition out of that? You know, like how to, how do they keep it from becoming this like 20 year long pity party? So sometimes it's just about acting contrary to how you feel. When you find yourself in a pity party, you're going to sit on the couch and you don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. But you say, okay, well, what's one thing I could do? Maybe you volunteer for somebody. Maybe you donate $5 to an organization. Maybe you say, I'm going to clean the kitchen, even though I don't feel like it. I'm going to get up and I'm going to get moving. And one of the things I found, and this was probably one of the most powerful things that I've done since my first husband passed away on his birthday, as it was approaching, I thought, what am I going to do? I don't want to go to work that day, but if I take the day off, I'm just going to sit at home and feel awful and horrible. And it's going to be a dreadful day. And in fact, I'm going to dread the day. And then when it gets there, it's just going to be a really sad day. And then after that, I'm probably going to feel really bad. Mm -hmm. So I approached my mother-in-law and I said, what are you thinking about doing that day? And she said, I think we should go skydiving. And my husband was this adventurous guy who loved to do fun things. And so we did, we went skydiving on his birthday and 
so all of these years later, we still go on an adventure on his birthday. We've ridden mules into the Grand Canyon. We've gone hang gliding. We take surfing lessons or flying trapeze lessons. We do something. And it's a way to honor him. And sure, there's still some sadness around it. But on the other hand, sometimes the whole family gets involved or friends. And it's just a great way to honor his memory and keeps me from sitting around feeling sorry for myself that day because it's so tempting to do, but there's no reason for it. It's not going to help anything. I love that so much. You're like exemplifying life design to the max. Like you're just like, no, I'm <laughs> I'm going to choose how this goes instead of just being a victim to it and rolling around. And because it's what you were saying before about taking the day off work and just being sad leading up during and after that's kind of the norm. That's what right. you're expected to do. That would be a normal approach, but you're like, mm, I don't like the results I'm getting out of that. So let's switch it, which is so cool and empowering. Right. And if you think about it, it's right. like, I'm sure if, if I had passed, man, how happy would I be if that's what my <laughs> loved ones were doing to, to honor me? I'd be like, yes, God, please be happy. <laughs> right. Right. And that's what, that's what I kept thinking. You know, he wouldn't want us to all sit around separately and be yeah. sad. I thought, you know, he would want us to go out and just celebrate the fact that even though he was only here 26 years, I'm glad he was here for 26 years and it's okay to go out and celebrate that fact. And we can still recognize, yes, we miss him and we wish he had been here a lot longer, but but let's celebrate what we had while we still yeah. honor what we lost. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So what's what's another one? What's another big hitter that you see? Another big one is not to resent other people's success, which of mm. course in the age of social media is tougher than ever because we look around at everybody else's Instagram feed and convince ourselves that everybody else is happier, healthier, wealthier, and they have a better life than we do. And I mean, a study after study will show it only takes a few minutes of scrolling through social media before you start to compare yourself and then you start to feel bad. And yet we go back for more. It's one of the few things in life that we just keep going back for more. We get a dopamine hit in our brain when we get a like on something, yet we scroll through and look at everybody else's likes and then we start to feel bad. That person got more likes than I do. They have more friends than I do. It's a bizarre phenomenon. And it's not that I'm against social media. I'm not. I use social media personally and professionally all the time. But I think we have to be aware of how it's affecting us and to recognize, okay, when I am on social media, do I start to tell myself a story that somebody else is doing better, that they have a much more fortunate, happier life than I do, that I just have bad luck? And we lose sight of the fact that so many people are just sharing their highlights. And even, you know, it's become sort of a trend these days to share some of your faults or your failures. But you'll, if you pay attention to that, you'll notice and people are really picky about what they share. Even sometimes it's like a humble brag of like, oh, my Ferrari has a dent in it. I'm such a bad driver. And, and to just, you know, again, be aware, people aren't really sharing their real lives and, and that's okay. And you don't have to get on there and, and bear your soul either. But to just be aware that just because somebody else looks like they're doing better doesn't mean they are. But even if somebody else has something you want, you can choose to be inspired by it rather than cause it to, um, to tell yourself the story that you're not as good and you'll never be as good. Instead, studies will show this too. If you just simply look at somebody else as an opinion holder, instead of comparing yourself, that you're not in competition. So if you just think, well, that person has something that I could learn from rather than that person's keeping me from getting what I want. That right. subtle shift in mindset makes a huge difference in your mental health. Right. Yeah. I always say the information age can either make you feel like crap or we are the luckiest people that have ever lived. Like I think the fact that yes. I can go learn from Tony Robbins or, you know, billionaires that are willing to share how they think and how they live on a podcast for free on the internet. I'm like, I have access to that. I'm so lucky instead of being there like, well, he can do it, but I can't. It's like, what, what nuggets can I take from this and apply in my own life? And I think for me, that's why social media has been such a positive experience for me. And I have very, I would say for me, I'm usually like, I'm just looking for patterns for success. I'm like, okay, I don't even care if that person comes off really abrasive and annoying, but they, they have what I want in that one area. So like, what can be learned here? Like what, you know, what, what nugget can I take? But I have found that every once in a while, if it's an area that hits me right to the core, I'm like, oh man, like how come she's making it so big like that? Like, how come I'm not, you know, and it's, that's a beautiful learning opportunity of like these self-limiting beliefs, like you're talking about. Right. These, these thought patterns of like, why, wait, why do I think that she has, 
she can have it, but I can't, or that's to me, that's such a beautiful opportunity to see what's really going on in these stories in my head. Right. It is to identify exactly what it is that we tell ourselves. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I can't ever have that. Or I, you know, don't have enough talent. I don't have enough money. And we just come up with these stories about other people and then about ourselves. And I love that you said that that's an opportunity because I think it is. And if we just looked at more of those times as an opportunity to learn more about ourselves, it would increase our self-awareness and then we can change it. That's right. Yeah. Cause there's some crazy story, you know, like when I see a woman that's fit, like that doesn't, it doesn't do much to me because I'm also fit and I know what it takes to get more fit. And I like, that's, it's not an area of like, I know for a lot of women it is if they haven't achieved that yet, but let's say it's maybe the business success I haven't achieved yet for me, like that will be because there's a limiting belief there that causes me to think like, well, they can have it, but I can't. And Oh man, when I unravel that, it's like, Ooh, but that that's how we grow. That's how I next level. It's so, it's so great. (laughs) Honestly, if we can look at it that way. So I love, I love your points. I love your points on this. All right, let's do, let's hit, let's hit one more. And then I'd love to go into your books. Cause you have some other books that I'd love to snag in to, to, um, veer into after this. What's one more big hitter. Uh, the other big one is probably, um, that mentally strong people don't give up after their first failure. Mm. And this is another one that, you know, when you fail, it depends on how you look at failure. If you look at failure as part of the process, then, you know, okay, I'm learning from this again. Mm-hmm. It's all about that growth mindset. But so often, you know, it's embarrassing to fail. We don't want to fail. We don't want to put ourselves out there. We doubt our ability to handle failure. So we just don't try. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, they did this study on um, teenagers where they said, you know, we're going to really promote all of these scientists and we're going to talk about all these famous astronauts and physicists and see what happens. Well, the more they talked about how well these people did, the more the students' grades declined. So then they started telling them about these famous failures. Oh, well, you know, Edison didn't just invent the light bulb. He had all these other experiments that didn't work. Wow. Einstein didn't just, you know, succeed the first time. Here's how many times he failed. The more they explained how these really successful people had failed, the students' mm. grades went up. They wow. felt like they were empowered to make a mistake. They weren't afraid to put themselves out there and to try something new. And I just think what a valuable lesson. So often we just want to say, well, I never failed or everything goes well in my life. But if everything's going well, you never embarrass yourself, you never fail, you're probably not putting yourself to the test. How will you know how much you can succeed unless you push yourself to the limits? And failure is just proof. Okay, I'm pushing myself. And if you fail again, it means you keep pushing yourself. And I think we need to look at more evidence that we're pushing ourselves to the limits more often. Yeah. And I think we all like, it's our egos getting the way. Cause we're like, I, before I release this to the world, it has to be perfect. Yes. So everyone knows that I'm perfect. And then we get stuck in it. Cause it's like, right. it's never, that's never going to happen because you can't get better until you suck at it first in front of other yep. people. <laughs> so a friend of mine really helped me with that. That resonates so much. He was here. I'm witnessing him make millions of dollars off this program that he's written. And he's like, yeah, we're like on version eight of that program. Like, you know how many emails we got back of people being like, this is messed up. They're like, I don't understand that. He's like, we've had to revise and revise and revise. Right. And it was such a beautiful, I'm like, ah, thank you for telling me that. Cause I was still trapped in this. Like I have to create the most perfect mind blowing program. That's going to change the universe, you know? And it's just like, you can't get there until you step out until you right. learn and get feedback from people. And, you know, it's kind of like being on podcasts or being on stage when you speak, I'm sure, you know, you couldn't get better at that unless you were doing it. Right. <laughs> right. In so. the beginning, it was not good, but I had to put myself out there and say, I'm going to try anyway. And knowing that I was going to fail sometimes and I did, but I learned from it every time. I think, well, when I was listening to your Ted talk, one thing that stood out to me about you, and I think this kind of goes back to your article going viral too, is that you are just really real. You're just speaking from the heart. You're just connecting. And I think when we do that, you don't have to worry so much about all these extra, Ooh, like, am I perfect? And all this It's just connect with people. Just like feel, feel, <laughs> feel in your heart right. and speak from your heart and it gets so much better. Right. Cause that's, that's what I noticed about you. And, um, you know, L L connected us and I was texting her. I'm like, she's awesome. <laughs> and she's like, Thank you. she's like, yeah, yeah. I like met her at a party and we super connected. And I'm like, I get it because you're, you're speaking from your heart. You're being real 
right? And I think that's such a the valuable asset. And that if you just continue to do that, like you'll just get better at all these little extra skills of <laughs> speaking, you know, podcasting and all of that. So yeah, for me, the big shift came when I stopped focusing on myself. It used to be, I mean, I was phobic of public speaking and I would be terrified. What if I stumble over my words? What if I say something dumb? What if I forget what I'm supposed to say? And when I stopped focusing on that and I just started focusing on what do I want the audience to walk away with? What do I hope that they learn? What do I want them to gain? Then it became a completely different ballgame. Exactly. Yeah. The nerves kind of subside for sure. Okay. Right. Speaking of speaking of podcasting, you're starting your own podcast that's coming out soon. Can you want to share about that? Sure. So one of the things I've, I've written four books now on mental strength, but one of the pieces that I felt like what was still missing was really being able to share other people's stories. So my podcast is going to be called Mentally Strong People, and it's my opportunity to share other people's journeys. What strategies do they use to stay mentally strong? My books are about the ones that worked for me and the ones that I learned from my therapy office, but now I want to tell other people's stories. So we're interviewing a lot of people. I'll do some solo episodes where I talk about mental strength as well, but it's been so fun. We've started doing interviews. We haven't released them yet. We will soon, but to just talk to people from all walks of life, uh, whether they are a, an elite athlete or it's a, somebody that runs their own business to just say, what are your strategies? What helps you get up every day? What makes you get through the tough times and what skills do you have? When are some times when you failed and what did you learn from it? So it's been a really fun learning experience already to figure out, you know, what makes other people tick again. So I guess I feel sort of like I get to be back in the therapy office asking people questions, but now I get to then put that out there and share it with the world. I love it so much. I think that's the most valuable thing that we get from each other as human beings is like, what lessons did you already learn in your journey that you can just share with me? And now I can like download that lesson through you. Right. Thank you for sharing that with me. That's so valuable. And it's in the nuances, right? I'm sure you've noticed this. It's like the stuff that people don't even think is going to make an impact on other people is what makes right. the most impact. It's like just your mentality about something. It's like, Hmm, that mentality is very different than mine. Thank you. You know, and they don't realize it because <laughs> they're like, that's just how they right. work. So I love that you're doing that because then you get to hear it in the nuances. <laughs> right. Yeah. Those little things, you know, I was interviewing one guest and he's wearing his pajamas and it's, you know, two in the afternoon and he's talking about something completely different. I said, well, we have to address the fact that you're wearing pajamas. And he said, oh yeah, this is my experiment. I've been doing it for 42 days. <laughs> And I just wanted to see what would happen if you wear pajamas every day. <laughs> Wait, we have to talk about that. <laughs> and yeah. just, you know, little things I think that sometimes we, we get so used to doing or we think oh, I do this in my life and you forget that maybe somebody could really learn from that one thing that you've picked up on and you've started doing in your life. So I'm so excited to be able to share those little things with other people. Yeah, amazing. What's the podcast called? It'd be called Mentally Strong People. Mentally Strong People. Okay, so your books. So will you share your, the titles of your books are 13 things mentally strong people don't do, right? That's your first one. And then you have parents, 13 things mentally strong parents don't do and women, which is awesome. Um, could you, could you share a little bit on the nuance of women, uh, something there? Cause I, I coach all women. So I'm like, just super curious. What, what comes to mind specifically for women? Yeah. So, you know, my books have really been about what readers ask. When my first book came out, everybody kept saying, I need to know how do I teach this to kids? Because I wish I had learned about mental strength sooner. So I said, great, we'll write the parenting book then. And I did. I wrote the parenting book after that to say, you know, you can be your own mental strength coach for your kids. Here's how you do it. Just don't do these certain parenting habits. And then when that book came out, I had a lot of women in particular reaching out to me and they said, you know, how do you be a mentally strong woman in today's world? And I realized so often when we talk about mental toughness, we talk about an an elite athlete or a Navy SEAL, and so often they're men. True. And I had women who say, you know, whether they were a stay-at-home parent or it was a woman running her own business or she's in the corporate world, she said, you know, we have certain barriers that maybe men don't face or certain struggles. I want to know, how do you be a strong woman in today's world? And so I was happy to write that book to talk about certain pressures that women feel. If we take one example, it's the culture of of beauty and how women look and how we are judged a lot more harshly for our appearance and how many hours and how much women spend, how much money they put into their appearance as compared to men. And yet we often, if you look at a woman's magazine, it's full of productivity tips as if we are somehow at fault for not getting everything done in one day. And so while I was thinking about these things, I thought, you know, 
sort of society sets us up for certain habits and it puts more pressure on us. So I wanted to talk about how do you push back on some of those habits? And it's not to say that men are right and women are wrong, but how have we raised little girls in a way that's slightly different than boys and how has that affected us? And one study in particular that disturbs me greatly is they ask five-year-old little boys and little girls to point to somebody who's brilliant. And all the little girls point to a woman and all the little boys point to a man. Great. Well, they ask them at age seven, point to somebody who's brilliant. All the little boys still point to a man, but so do the little girls. They no longer point to women. And you think, well, what happens between the ages of five and seven? They go to school. And who do we show them who who are the presidents and who are the the scientists and who are all these historical figures, it's primarily men. Wow. And so you think, well, what impact does that have on little girls as they're growing up? And even though adults say things like, you can be anything you want, we're giving them a different message. And so you think, how, you know, how does that affect me as a woman when I was growing up? And of course, we have more self-awareness about those things now, but even back then, you know, I was told you can do anything you want, but at the same time, our society doesn't necessarily show us that. And so uh, I just really wanted to write a book that shared some of those things that mentally strong women don't do. And one big issue is imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. that as women, we often feel like we don't deserve the success we have, or when we do get to be successful, we think it's just dumb luck. We have trouble taking credit for our work. And we have trouble owning our success right down to if you look at a a woman's profile on LinkedIn compared to a man's, even if they have similar education and similar experience, men go in one direction where they really brag about how awesome they are and women downplay their success. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not to say that men are right and women are wrong, but to look at how does that impact your ability to get a job. If you're on LinkedIn hoping to, to network with people, hoping to get a new job and you downplay your success, that's going to affect your, your job prospects. And there's a lot of examples like that, even down to compliments as women, when somebody says, Hey, I really like your shoes. We're really likely to give a compliment back. Like, Oh, I love your shoes. Or we say something like, I got these on sale for $10. Like, yeah. Kind of like we minimize it or, <laughs> uh, or, you know, we're quick to like give credit to somebody else. Well, so-and-so bought them for me. I didn't pick them out almost yeah. like we're embarrassed to say, thank you. Right. And so one of the biggest messages in my book is to say, it's okay to own your success. You can acknowledge yeah. that you're awesome and you're not putting out, putting other people down by doing that. And if other people are uncomfortable with your success, that's their issue, not yours. You don't have to shrink yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes that that false modesty or it is actually ego. It is actually right. ego because it's like, I want to look like a real humble person here right now. So I'm going to do this weird thing where I know my shoes are cool. That's why I picked them. They're really rad. <laughs> and you're giving right. me a compliment. Like it's actually your ego getting the way there by saying like, oh yeah, oh no, they're but it's like, dude, just be real. You think those shoes are cool too, and that's why you bought them. Just say thank you. <laughs> right, right. And you know, I think and for so many people they'll say, Well, that's really uncomfortable. <laughs> that's okay. You can still say thank you, and it can feel uncomfortable. Again, it goes back to saying you can handle being uncomfortable and that you don't have to go through life just avoiding discomfort. Yeah. Okay. I got to pick your brain on this. I don't know if it came up in that, in the book with women, but one thing that I've noticed, I hear a lot from, cause I'm in the dating scene right now. I was married for 13 years and now I'm dating. And one thing I hear a lot from guys when I'm dating is that they, they're like surprised when they can give me honest feedback and I'm fascinated by it. And I'm like, Oh, cool. Okay. Like, wow, thank you so much for telling me that. And they're like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Like usually like I cannot say, say stuff like that to women. Like they get really a a hurt. They take it personally. Is there anything in those habits that kind of resonates with you there as to why? Because I just hear that all the time. I'm like, girls, ladies, we have got to stop this. It's making us look like fools. <laughs> there is. So I've got a whole chapter about how important it is not to let somebody else limit your potential. Because mm-hmm. I think there have been times, probably all of us could recount in our lives where somebody said something and we were insulted by it almost to a way though where we allowed it to limit us. So if you had a teacher that said you weren't very bright, maybe you went on to think to believe that was true and maybe it affected the classes you took or the career choice that you made. But because of that, then sometimes we get so defensive when it comes to feedback. We label everybody a hater. We're quick to say, you know, you can't do that. And we don't take it. And so it's so important to learn, you know, when somebody gives you feedback, to be able to differentiate. Are they trying to elevate themselves and look better or are they trying to actually help me? 
And when you have good friends, good family, you have a boss who cares about you, their feedback is about you. They're trying to help you get better. And if you can hear that, although it's hard to hear sometimes, and for a lot of us, it cuts to your core, especially if you're really proud of something and somebody says, actually, it's not the way that you think it is, or I see it differently than you do. That's tough to hear. Yeah. But when somebody's trying to make you better, you should be thankful to have that person in your life. And when they can deliver that news in a kind and caring way, and then to figure out how do I take this information and do something with it that's helpful. But so many of us either just tune out any sort of criticism, we get so defensive, we can't hear it, or we allow it to cut to our core, no matter where it comes from. We don't discriminate between a random stranger on Twitter versus you know, your mother giving you honest feedback. And I think right. in studies will show too, a lot of people who give out feedback, it's often more about themselves than it is about you. So sometimes, mm. you know, the random stranger on Twitter, when they say that you're an idiot, well, guess what? They think that they're an idiot and they're calling other people names. Like it's just across the board that most people just sort of put out a mirror of how they feel about themselves. Yeah. But on the other hand, when you have a loving, kind, caring person in your life who's giving you feedback, to be able to honestly hear that and say, how do I apply this to my life? Thank you. That's yeah. tough to do, but it's yeah. so important. If you really honestly want to get better, you need to be open to that because we see ourselves in a certain way and the people around us see ourselves differently. And mm-hmm. to say, oh, I see myself as being kind and caring and generous and when you're with somebody who says, you know, actually you sounded really rude on that phone call. Oh, did I, you know, and then you can say like, what did I say? Or how did I come across? I thought I was being assertive. You think I'm being a jerk. Let's talk about this. And you can learn from that moving forward. Yeah. I think when you get kind of obsessed with growth, those things start looking like gifts instead of threats, right? Exactly. Ooh, thank you for being like a real and honest enough person to just say what you were thinking. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. That's a high risk situation to be like, Hey Tara, like, you sound so annoying on your podcast or whatever. Like, like that's a high risk thing to say. So I'm like, mm. and I love what you said too, is like, let it go through that filter of, is this a person who really cares about me? Like that knows me well, like why would they put themselves at that risk to say something like that? You know, and is it about them? Do they have a podcast that they just started on and they sound <laughs> annoying, you know? Right. No, they don't. Okay. Why would they say that then? Let me at least consider it. That's where I go is like, let me at least consider it for a second. And that's taken a lot of work for me too. Cause yes, by far, like my dad used to always be like, Tara, you are so defensive. You know, (laughs) my little fragile ego couldn't handle it. But if you get obsessed with growth, man, those are cool learning opportunities when people are willing to put themselves on the line and say stuff. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. (laughs) Um, okay. So last, last thing I guess we'll talk about is like when you're, when you're working, cause you work with high performers. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Have you, I, I was curious, like, have you noticed a disconnect because you know, health and fitness is my realm, but I also love mindset also. So like, have you noticed a disconnect between like business success or sports success? And then like, personal life or, you know, like being able, they have these habits in one area, they're really strong in one area, but they're not in another. Or do you feel like it's a, how you do anything is how you do everything. Like what has been your experience there? Yeah. And I'm glad you asked that. Nobody really asked that question very often, but I think you can be strong in one area and really weak in another area. I mean, we see this all the time and I don't know why so many people think, no, everything you do, everything exactly the same. It doesn't make sense. Uh, if we took, um, the example, like the last dance just came out with Michael Jordan, everybody's talking about most amazing basketball player ever. We also think he had a gambling problem, right? Mm -hmm. How can you have so much self-discipline in one area of your life that you can become one of the world's best basketball players, but at the same time, you might not be able to control how much money you're betting. And there's so many areas that I think people are like that. Or um, the football player, Rudy, who, you know, we made the movie about and talk about, you know, his triumphs and his love for football and how he's the underdog. Well, then he went on to fall prey to this get rich quick scheme later in life and and did all of these things and got himself into big trouble because he couldn't delay gratification in that area of his life. Or we look at, you know, Tiger Woods, who did so well on the on the golf course, yet at the same time, supposedly has these mistresses and sex addiction. So you just say to yourself, well, no, you can do really well professionally and be struggling personally or vice versa. And we all have areas of weakness. Somebody might be the most awesome person at business, yet at the same time, struggle with eating habits. Or somebody who says, you know, I'm I'm just so self-disciplined in in my fitness life, but at the same time, I'm cheating on my spouse. Who knows? But I think for all of us to know, just because you appear really strong and really successful in one area 
of your life doesn't guarantee it's going to spill over into every area of your life. Yeah. It feels almost like you have to start from scratch in each area, like your relationships, right. your business, your fitness, your personal life, because um, I, I see that I ask, cause I see this all the time. I work with high performers too. And it's like, man, you're running multiple multi-million dollar businesses. You know, I'm like, how can you not apply these same principles to success to your eating and your training? Like, it's like, you just get it done. It's do or do not like, you know, right. So I, it does. It feels like you just, you, there's a lot of limiting mindsets. I think that we haven't addressed and they come in multiple areas. So it does to me, feels like we have to start from scratch in each of those areas. But I'm fascinated by that talk. Like, Michael Jordan, for example, like I'm fast. I'm like, what was the psychology? What was the driver? What, what was deeply in there to get him to get there on the basketball level, but then not in the financial level? Like, Ooh, that's, that's like financial. I mean, sorry, like, um, emotional or psychological, like <laughs> gluttony for me. I'm like, what's going on there? <laughs> Isn't it fascinating? And I yeah. think we, we forget that we just think, oh, you're either self-disciplined or you're not right. Or you're emotionally intelligent or you're not. Nope. I think there are zillions of examples we could come up with where people just start who are super successful in one area really struggle in another area. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. I, I think for me right now, that's definitely been awesome to witness in myself going from achieving fitness success. That was really cool. It's a great personal development journey. Like your ab challenge or whatever, you, whatever you're still doing, like clearly you have learned a lot of new habits that you weren't born with, you know, like right. just like born with those habits. Um, but it's cool to take the lessons learned and then tr- apply them to these other areas for sure. It's, it's really cool. And I think that's another thing I, I wonder if you've seen is like, a lot of people probably don't know why they have the success that they do. They don't understand that they have these habits. So you're like that they don't have the bad habits, right? Because right? Right. it wouldn't occur to me that I don't have a gambling addiction. Like <laughs> I haven't right. thought about that really, you know? So um, anyway, I love that you're bringing all of this stuff to light. So guys, um, actually I'll let you say, where, do, where would you prefer, if they want to find out more about all this stuff, where would you have them go? So my website's the best place. Amy Morin, LCSW is in licensed clinical social worker.com. There's a link to my Ted talk and my books and my podcast will be there soon as well. Awesome. Yeah. The website looks amazing guys. That's A-M-Y-M-O-R-I-N-L-S-C-W. L-C-S-W. L-C-S-W.com. And we'll link it in the show notes. But Amy, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing this. Thank you for like speaking from your heart and keeping it real and connecting with everybody. Because everybody who listens, I know is like, oh, that's truth. That's truth. And I know it came through your own deep journey, through your journey. And thank, so thank you for sharing that. Oh, thank you so much. Today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> 